You're listening to Coding Blocks, episode 76. Subscribe to us and leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, and more using your favorite podcast app. And check us out at codingblocks.net where you can find show notes, examples, discussion, and a lot more. Send your feedback, questions, and rants to comments at Coding Blocks. Follow us on Twitter at Coding Blocks or head to www.codingblocks.net and find all our social links there at the top of the page. With that, I'm Alan Underwood. I'm Joe Zach. I like, I like what you did there. I'm Michael Outlaw. <laughs> it was nice and fast. All right, here we go. We're going to kick off a little bit of podcast news. This one's going to be short and sweet today. So, Jay-Z, what you got for us? All right, I got a couple of iTunes reviews here. Um, first one from S. Rolson. And actually, that's it. <laughs> so, a couple equal one. Yep, that's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, and for, for Stitcher, we were lucky to even get this one in because we were having problems uh, even getting Stitcher to load, they they would only show that you were yes you were visiting www.stitcher.com and that was it. Yes, that was all page. you would get. It was nice. Um, but uh, yeah, so thank you to Jack of All Pythons Love for writing name. in your review. <laughs> Love that name. The clarity. <laughs> yeah. So I thought this would be. I saw this article and I thought, oh, this will be an interesting thing to uh, bring up in this section here. Tech Republic posted a article on the five worst programming languages to learn in 2018. So if you have, if you want to spend some free time learning some languages, what might you think would be in that top five? I don't know what they would have put here. Honestly, top five worst. Yeah. Top five worst. And uh, I, I was kind of worried about this. I saw this one um, when I was like waiting for my food at Five Guys or something in this article. I was like, I don't know if I will read it. I think I'm going to be offended. Um, and I was, I was definitely surprised by some of these. I, I guess we should probably talk about what they are. Huh? Uh, Number one on the list is Dart. Huh. Okay. Don't that was bother wasting your time. One, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, Google language developed in 2011. But uh, this came from low engagement across GitHub, Stack Overflow, Freenode, Reddit, Twitter, Facebook. Um, number two is, I find interesting, Objective C. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where I was surprised. Like, Dart, was, okay, you know, Google has a history of kind of abandoning things. You know, luckily, Go's done really well. So I wasn't surprised to see Dart here. Objective C, though, is like, that's still really used. You know, is, Swift came around. Swift, but. I think, is the, is the reason they're, yeah. they're doing that. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah, Apple, Apple was pushing heavy for Swift. Yeah. And, and everything's a lot easier in Swift than it is in Objective-C. Right. right. Um, I was to see it just because it is such on, on, on such a, pl- a prominent platform. Right. But, hey, all right. Number three, CoffeeScript. Hmm. I feel like we talked about that one. Not, I think that I felt like that one came up recently, or well, recently as in like the last six months. Yeah. <laughs> if that's recent. Yeah. Um. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, n- number four, I haven't heard of, so I'm going to mispronounce this one. But Lua. Uh, this one really surprised me. It's used a lot a for game scripting, one, right? Yeah. yeah, it's just a nice little uh, scripting language. I see it all used a lot for like mods and games and. And things like that. So I'm really surprised. Like, there's still some really popular game frameworks that are built on it. So I had a hard time with this, but uh, I guess I guess other tools have kind of grown up and being used more often. Like Unity is really popular in the game space. So maybe now, that's what it is. Now I feel like number five is going to hurt some feelings. Yep. You ready for this one? Uh, um, I think number five, Erlang. Ooh. It's not going to hurt our feelings. Our buddy John, know, yeah. John's, John just he hung up on the podcast. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. that one. I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say that it doesn't make sense that it's not that it's on the list, but at the same time, it's like, oh yeah, that one. There's a little salt on the wound for that one. <laughs> well, if you ever tried to use it, it's it's truly a miserable experience. <laughs> 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 I, I could say, um, what was the book? It was like the seven languages in seven weeks or something book that that was the only time I've ever messed with it. So like, that's not a real, you know, experience. So I, I really can't say anything. Sorry to anyone who uses Erlang or is a fan of it, but I just know it definitely. Um, and the reason it was in the book to begin with is because it's a different programming 
kind of paradigm is a very different way of thinking and it's functional language. Yeah, it's functional and especially weird. <laughs> it's painful. Oh, I love that. I, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Like Erling is. I guess that means that Haskell's going to win out for all things functional then. Uh, I think so. Or yeah. F sharp. F sharp's there. Um, okay. Well, no. Yeah, probably, <laughs> probably not. Well, if you're if you're in the Microsoft ecosystem, if you're uh, I guess if you're in Java ecosystem, what like is Clojure like reigning supreme? Or I, mean, uh, I don't know. Let us know. Like if you're if you're working with the functional language that we're neglecting, you should tell us about it. Yep. And if you are a developer of one of those five languages, <laughs> also <laughs> let us know. Seek and shelter. in fact, in fact, you can comment on this episode for a chance to win a copy of clean architecture. Yeah. With whatever your comment is, but that'd be a great topic right there. So, you know, I'll tell you too, I, I was once heavily invested in a language that people started talking about um, being dead and it became a little joke. Like every year people would say it was dead. Let me tell you, it's dead now. <laughs> Which one? Uh, Cold fusion. <laughs> That's right. I knew he was going to say it. Yeah, it's no longer a joke. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, small fraction of a, of its popularity and so i like now whenever someone says like a, a language is dying like i kind of believe it you know just yeah, like no. silver light was lying people said flash is dying like you know probably probably is abandoned ship there was just a user stat that came out recently or not a user stat but a stat that came out that flash i think it was in chrome flash use in chrome has dropped like 80 percent since 2014 like massive right like the ipad killed it <laughs> apple apple killed flash but anyways all right so what you got up next joe uh, well now now i feel bad for talking about bad about cold fusion it's not dead it's still doing great things it still serves a, a great purpose but uh-huh. definitely uh changed a lot over the years yeah it's the best uh, way to serve up all your flash sites <laughs> 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 Moving along. Um, hey, uh, Coding Blocks <laughs> is sponsoring our Orlando Code Camp this year. So that means if you're going to Orlando Code Camp, which is either a free or nearly free event, I it might cost five bucks um, this year. But uh, there's going to be stickers in the bag. So free stickers just for going to the event. And you can go check out my talk. It's going to be at 10 a.m. And um, hopefully you guys will enjoy it. And I'll have a little link to the show notes. If you live around Central Florida, you should definitely come check it out and uh, you know, come kick me in the shins or something. I'll give you a high five. <laughs> <laughs> okay right uh, so you're you're actually asking people to kick you okay yeah yeah and you'll never be I'll, I'll be wearing a coding block shirt probably ms dev sh- uh, hat and i'll be walking around kicking people's shins <laughs> and, and he'll have a kick me sign <laughs> on his back yeah and joe's not a small dude like you, you'll nope. be like okay i'll kick that dude wait no i'm not doing that <laughs> yeah in fairness i'm also really awkward so it'll probably be on accident <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, I already mentioned that uh, if you want to leave a comment on this episode for a chance to win a copy of Clean Architecture, please do so. But uh, if you'd like to help us out in other ways, you can head to www.codingbox.net slash resources. And there you can find uh, links to uh, you know various affiliates where, you know, if you were going to buy something anyways, buy a copy of a book or something like that anyways, or, you know, uh, then you know, why not go through that and help us out too? Yeah, right? Plural Site in particular has a great affiliate program. So if you want to help us out and uh, you're a fan of Plural Site like we are, then if you use our link, uh, we will really appreciate that. Yep. All right. And so let's get into the meat of this episode, which is basically kind of bringing everything to, we're wrapping it up on clean architecture, right? So it's been a few months in the making. And uh, let's go ahead and jump on into it. So in this one, we're going to talk, starting off at least, about presenters and humble objects. So what, what's a humble object, guys? Is that, is that one that's just not too full of itself? I'd never heard this term before reading this chapter. And once I read it, I was like, that's a really cool like, idea. Or it's a, that's a cool thing to have a word for. Yeah. <laughs> there should be a word for that. Yeah, I'd never heard of this pattern. Um, uh, I'm, I agree with you there. It's, it's a... It says it's the design pattern that was originally identified as a way to help unit testers separate behaviors that are hard to test from the behaviors that are easy to test. And the pattern itself was called the humble object pattern. So yeah, I'd never heard of it. And, and this was really cool. I mean, the, the harder to the test stuff were things like the UI, 
which I think we all know, right? Like the UI changes so much to trying to unit test that it's impossible. You're just constantly chasing your tail. Yeah, and so the Hubble object is, is it's all that dirty stuff, right? It's when we talk about pushing things to the edges, pushing those dependencies out, pushing your integrations with thirty third parties out to the edges. Like these are the edges. These are where we put that code that needs to deal with other things that we, you know, like at some point you can't mock anymore. You can't put any more interfaces in place. You just have to touch the other stuff. And so the idea is that you lump that code into particular objects, like in these humble objects. And they're the ones that do all the dirty work. Yep. And I thought what was interesting here is I'd never heard it called this way before the presenter object that basically gets the data from the application tier and then hands it off to a view model. <laughs> that then goes to the view. I'd never heard of it done that way or, or, or called that way, I should say. But I mean, you typically call the controller, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your controller is what is going to go get the data to then give to your view model. And then your view model is going to be what's used by the view to populate the page. Right. So yeah, it, it was just a different approach. I don't know. But this was also, I, I want to be, a little clear here because I don't did we maybe we said this but in case we didn't I want to make sure this is called out because this kind of threw me for a loop because the humble object is the thing that's hard to test right right yep. and it that felt counterintuitive when I heard the the name humble object pattern in they in that first description that I gave of it right I was like oh I guess the things that are humble are the things that are easy to test but no those are the things that are hard to test they yeah. mentioned Go ahead. They mentioned later, though, like they, they wrapped it up and, and I should find the reference while you guys talk about this, but they wrapped it up at the end of that section that defined why they called it the humble object, because it does sound counterintuitive, right? It sounds like the humble object would be, hey, yeah, you test me out. That's fine. But it was the yeah. inverse. Well, the code that I write that deals with third parties is like not, I would never describe as humble. Like it's brazen. It's bold. <laughs> it's not humble. Right. Well, and that's why I was thinking that the humble, the, the object that is humble would be the one that's easy to test, right? But yeah, I was totally wrong about that. Um, yeah, there was another thing in here that like totally threw me too. Uh, you know, Alan, you were talking about the views and the view models. And, um, you know, as he was going through this section about the presenters and views, and he says that there's nothing, you know, you should have nothing in your view except for the presentation of the data period and that's it right right no logic whatsoever none no logic just presentation period now the, okay before you go on with that that's where this wrapped up so basic what you just said the view shouldn't do anything nothing is left for the view to do other than to load the data from the view model into the screen thus the view is humble so the view's not doing anything but it's also the hardest thing to test because it can change so much so, okay all right. Okay. So that's okay. that's okay. why they that's why they put it that way. All right. Now, continue. Okay. Sorry. I, I I get that now. Um, but so so the view is doing nothing other than presenting data. Now, I ask you this because we're all aware of templates, right? So does this mean that you cannot have any conditionals in your templates for your view presentation? You you. Sh <laughs> so you you shouldn't honestly so right well, according to this you shouldn't so uh, like i guess the way i approach it typically is like if you see something in the ui to where you're making some sort of decision based off hey if this value is this then show this or what i try and pass that down from the server layer anyways because the problem is if if that data that's going to be coming back to you somehow has to be validated against it I want to be the server or the, the place that's sending and getting that data to be the source of truth, right? So well, I, let me rephrase this in a different way then. Okay. Let's say that you are writing your new Angular component and uh, you've got, you're, you're just writing out the, um, you know, I'm calling it a template, but you know, the, the HTML like, you know, part of the code, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to say, hey, there's going to be a list of, uh, usernames and for every username print out a div that uh, in in that div you know there'll be a span for the username and things like that right so for 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 each user print this out right but if there's zero users right then that thing is it's conditionally deciding like oh don't display anything then there's nothing to display there right 
Yeah. Now that's just an example that you could technically in those same type of templates, whether it be a uh, view JS or angular or react or whatever templating method you, you know, uh, framework you're using, you could do other things like, Hey, if the, if this has, if this array has some data, then go through that for loop. Like I said, otherwise maybe I print something else out to the screen that says there is nothing. So it kind of made it sound like, Hey, your, your template should have zero logic. Yeah. That's that, that's walking the line, right? Like I, I feel like what you just said is just typical view you're not building business logic into it you're literally just trying to make sure the ui looks nice you know and is descriptive so i don't don't know that that i think business i think the term business logic though can be yeah it's one of those things like we kind of had joked about this last time with the i think when we made some joke about the you know depending on who you're talking to right like that kind of terms like that can be relative to who you're your target audience it's true. is right. It's true. And if you're if you're the UI guy, if you're focused on or gal, and you're just focused on that, then you know you're gonna be like, hey, my business rule is like when there is this data, this div gets populated with these spans. Or yeah, that that's a tough one. I, I do think that probably, eh, I think the the more relevant part that they were talking about was if you have to format data in a particular way, right? Don't make your view do that. There should be whatever is populating that view model or no, the view model itself. Wait, should, the view is all about presentation. So it's all about formatting. No, right? no, no. So what they were saying is like, if you needed to like, imagine you have some sort of accounting page, right? You have a balance sheet or something. If you needed something to be formatted in a particular currency, the view should not be doing that. That data should oh. be formatted. Okay. provided to the view model and then the view model is passed the view just grabs it out of the view model right and if you needed that thing to be read so another way to say this then would be like if you wanted something in a local currency or or local locality whatever that is right then you might let you know the uh, i think you were saying the, the presenter, presenter object would yep. make that decision yep of the, like okay let me translate this into the local currency formats or local you know uh, decimal formats or whatever and the view doesn't do that that's fine right i just wanted to clear because like i mean the view is all about like hey this is going to be formatted you know we're going to uppercase all of this lettering right but that shouldn't be done by the view. css right. land right and or, that's that's the crazy part like when you really start thinking about it that so i see joe shaking his head too that shouldn't be made at the view level right because then because that's that, what we're saying right Right. It should not be. And, and the interesting thing to bring in here too, is if you, if you've worked in the MVVM patterns where you have a view model, they're also saying that every single thing on that page that could be in that view page form, whatever it is, right. There should be a corresponding view model property for it. Right. So if you have a button, if you have, um, if you have fields, if you have whatever the view model, should be what is populating that entire thing. Like that view is supposed to be completely stupid. So to your point, CSS. If you want to add a class, you know, is the server supposed to return the class name to the view? That seems wrong. But what if you had maybe the div for the normal and the div for the red and both of them kind of have properties and then you have like a, you know, a hidden property or whatever that will show or hide or will include or not include. Well, see, that brings up a very important thing that you just said. You were talking about divs and and show, hide, and all that. And this is where things sort of fall apart is, and by the way, if you are somebody that returns HTML from a database, like you have some sort of prog Mm. that says, oh, I want this thing to be a red span, you are absolutely not doing it right. And the reason is, is because now you assume that your only consumer or only client of that data is a browser of right. some sort. Something that can read HTML. That That is not how you treat data, right? Like you should not be doing that. So that's where it's kind of interesting, right? So if you were to code everything, let's say, into your UI and you're doing an Angular app, right? And you want this thing to be read over here. Is that just because that particular client should see it read? Or if you have a mobile app, should it also be read there? Are you going to be recoding all these type of these transformations on every single platform you're doing? Or if you have a presenter object, does it make it easier? 
I mean, it does make it an interesting case. I mean, I guess what was kind of like um, a little bit, you know, mind opening for me, and this is why I brought this up, was because I, I'm okay with like when, when we were talking about like locale uh, type decisions being made in the presenter, you know, controller, whatever you want to call it, like server side. And you're deciding like, oh, I should return back the English version of this because you're in you know, the United States or, oh, you're in Spain. I'm going to return back the Spanish version of the text or I'm going to format things into pounds because you're in the UK or something. You know, like those kind of things, that makes sense that you wouldn't do that in the view. But in the view layer, like it was kind of a little bit mind blowing to me because I'm like, well, no, if I want something, uh, this text is all going to be uppercased you know, that's a, that's a view decision. Like on the server side, you shouldn't care how I want to present it. If you, if you returned back the name Alan Underwood, right. Then, you know, from the, the data side, return it back in its proper, you know, uppercase A and uppercase U, you know, kind of format. But if on my particular view presentation, I'm deciding I want it to be all uppercase because that's what this particular view wants, then I think that that decision belongs there not and i'll say too um you know with the formatting like if you're a wordpress and you've got a, a a table for posts and that each post has rich formatting and that's part of the requirement like i want to be able to bold stuff or I want to be able to have line breaks or whatever like you kind of got to return that you know no that's different though i'm not talking about when you actually put a blob of html in the database because okay. it's the expected output it is i'm saying like you have some sort of stored procedure that you know it, you, you're re, you need to return a numerator and a denominator, right? And you wanted to shortcut it and do, you know, <laughs> here's numerator, br tag, denominator. Like, no, that's not what you do, right? right? You return the two data pieces together and then whatever's consuming it, use it. In the case of like a WordPress blog post or something to where you actually embedded HTML in that because that's what you want it to look like, that's different, right? right. Like that's that's... I'm giving you the content that I want to get back out. Not I'm generating you some HTML because this is what the output calls for. Um, but yeah, man, I, here's the thing. I, I'm with you. If, if I'm doing something in a UI, like an angular type thing. Yeah. I'm going to do it in CSS and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it that way, but I probably would use something to format the locale and I probably would use something to do those various different things. But yeah, I mean the look of it, you well, know, I, I mean, mean, that's definitely an extreme. Right. And I mean, because right. like to me, like the view is all about the, the look, right? the look, right. But you know, going kind of taking a step backwards, they're going back to the logic of within your template, whatever that template may be like, you know, doing ifs or fours or whatever inside of that, uh, that, I mean, to me, that seems like a perfectly valid thing inside of your view, but it is a type of logic that he's saying that the, my interpretation of what he was saying was like, no, you shouldn't be doing that, which would just felt yeah. weird. I, I think that if so. you wanted to take it to that level where you were saying like, if there's zero <laughs> records, then maybe in your view model, you have an empty message type right. thing. You know what I'm saying? So, so for instance, maybe you have an empty message property and then if that empty message property is filled in, then it shows that empty message, right? Or, or something like that. So I think you can still, you can still accomplish it and not having your, your UI make a bunch of decisions for you. Yeah. I mean, it just gets weird though, because now, now you've just moved the decision to the, to the server side and now the server side is going to be like that for all use cases. And maybe that's okay. But let's say you wanted to have something like um, a banking application and you're like, hey, um, here's an API endpoint that will return back all of the transactions for the current calendar year, okay? And, um, you know, so you're going to get back an array of these transactions. Well, if there were zero transactions, I expect an array of zero, right? Not an array of one that has a string that says, Hey, there were none. Oh, no. It right? would be a separate property, though. Yeah. I think is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Like a show none message kind of property. Yes. Yes. So you'd have, you'd have your, your standard array that come back with a collection of whatever, if it had stuff or not. And then you'd have another one that's like, here's empty results message. Right? So it'd be two separate properties on it. And I think that's, I think that's how you accomplish what he's talking about in this whole view thing, right? To where really it, the view can kind of be dumb. 
Yeah, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna decline that pull request because you had a loop or a conditional on there. Right. No. Same here. Dang it, that's what I was going for. <laughs> I was trying to get you to deny it. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into testing and architecture. Yep. All right. Um, testing is pretty much unit testing is pretty much impossible without good architecture. And that's what they say. So there was a this great thing in here which I found. Uh, he says that the separation of these behaviors into those that can be tested and to those that can't, i.e. like when we're trying to break up our things into humble objects and those that aren't humble objects, that is often a boundary, an architectural boundary itself. Yep. Yep. And a lot of people say like, why should I write my test first? So well, you ever tried to test afterwards? <laughs> and so it, it's really hard. And so I think that um, that's a good test case. And it's like, if you can't write tests for your code or if it's really difficult, that's a good sign that you've got architectural problems. And it's a uh, shame. Hey, better no. Yeah, it's a shame they put this here though, because they go into it in more detail in a little while. And I really like some of the points that they that they bring up. So But it was because but I mean the reason why was because you're the humble object. The pattern humble object was yeah. all about separating the behaviors. So you could test. And so the once easy you stuff. separate those behaviors, then you've identified boundaries. Yeah, good point. You can test just about everything up to that humble but that humble humble bundle. <laughs> Humble, humble object. object. <laughs> humble bun- if you don't know about those, you get some good deals on video games, right? Yep. Or books. Or books. Yeah. Yep. There you go. All right. Uh, so the next one is uh, database gateways. Our it, favorite conversation. Yes. And we, we've, we've got a little bit of debate coming up here in a moment. Uh-uh. Um, I, so this is where they say that it contains all the interfaces for your CRUD operations to be implemented. So you create reads, if, okay, um, you know, we a lot of times throw out acronyms, create, read, update, delete, CRUD. So your, your typical storage type things. Yeah, these, these gateways will sit between the use cases and the database. And this is where the debate comes in. So I, I think probably all of us had to read this section a couple times. So my takeaway was NoSQL lives in the database gateway area. And I'll go back to like bullet point one here because it says it contains all the interfaces for the CRUD operations. And what they said is these interfaces are to be implemented by the appropriate classes. So your database implementations, whether that's an RDBMS, so relational database, or whether it's a document DB or something like that, those implementations are over there, but these are the interfaces. These database gateways are the interfaces that everybody has to sort of adhere to. Yeah, and this is where, like, I totally misread this part because, um, yes, he says that we don't allow SQL in the use case layer, but uh, he says that we use the gateway interfaces that have the appropriate method. So I'm, I misread that as like, oh, well, okay, fine. We're putting our SQL in these gateways. But as I understand it from Alan's take on it, that instead the gateway is an interface and you might have a, mes- an, a method on it. Like uh, I made that financial one. Uh, get, get all transactions. Get, get all transactions for current year. Right, so you might have an interface that defines a method called uh, get all transactions for current year, but there's no implementation behind that. That implementation would be in the database layer, and it would implement that uh, that method, and so it would have. That's where the SQL. Yes. That was you, my now understanding after you having said that you didn't agree with my take on. <laughs> <laughs> the sequel living where it should we actually do talk before the show sometimes um yeah i mean it, here's the thing like the the one huge takeaway for me and and we're going to talk about this a little bit more here in just a few minutes the one major takeaway for this whole clean architecture setup is tons of interfaces and yes. in like like i mean <laughs> going back to joe's i have this solid application that does nothing but i've got 5 million interfaces like when you start talking about these layers and they and they talk about these boundaries it's almost like if you think about there's the left side that's a layer and then there's the right side layer so you got your database then you have your application there's this there's this thing in the middle that are all your interfaces right that both of those sides have to adhere to. And, and that's really what the clean architecture is, is literally 
these abstractions, whether they're interfaces, and, and I take this back, it could be interfaces, it could be abstract classes, it could be any of that kind of stuff. But it's this, this thing in the middle that has no implementation that everything has to adhere to. And that's what this database gateway is. It's another one of these, you know, do nothing tiers. So, so let's make this a little bit more concrete. Um, you would have your, your database. So you might have a SQL server or an Oracle. And then on top of that, you're going to have some kind of ORM typically. So you might have an entity framework or a hibernate. Uh, and then above that, this is where kind of coming back to our DDD conversation, right? This is where you're going to have this database gateway yep. that implements the interfaces so that you're not letting uh, your entity framework um, implementation or usage or detail leak out into the rest of your application. You'd have this database gateway there sitting above the ORM that is, uh, you know, get all financial transactions for the last year, right? And then you have your use cases above that layer above the database gateway. And so when your use case for, you know, getting transactions for a time frame or, you know, for a current year, it's going to call a method on that interface, right? And it only knows of the interface. It doesn't know anything about any other implementation, whatever. You could swap it out with a version that reads off of a file. You could read, you know, swap it out with, with an Imbrant Hibernate version or uh, a Java hibernate version or entity framework, whatever. That's where, that's where the, the uh, benefit of having that layer of abstraction between the use case and the ORM buys you. Right. So what, what about an ORM list world or a world with a less of an ORM? Like, uh, you know, I think about a Dapper or Expando, I was any sort of lightweight framework that lets you easily query a proc or, or pass a query and get some sort of dynamic object back. So we've got our database still. Does that mean we have this little light layer that all it does is have like a little query and an object that it returns? Yeah, man. Just, it's just exactly the same, right? So your database layer, so use your database, your actual, you know, infrastructure, then your dapper, let's call it layer right there. And then your gateway interface. Like there's no reason it really has to be much anything else. I mean, but, I Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say with your, um, you know, when you referred to it as a, a little lightweight uh, ORM, like all that's really saying is like, you're just going to sprinkle all your um, SQL dependency and implementation out throughout your code. Well, unless, right, unless we have the layer. And that's where I was kind of going with is like, well, with Dapper, uh, you're uh, some sort of lightweight framework, right? Just kind of, it's real thin layer between my object that's coming out of it and the SQL. Um, what ends up happening is a you end up creating classes that get returned or get mapped to on the output right and so you're kind of hand creating your rm and putting them somewhere presumably in that same layer or you're returning dynamic objects and like we talked about last object last uh the last episode i believe it was uh, we talked about the the dangers of returning dynamic objects because you're letting your database which is implementation detail drive these core objects of your you know it's it's life without a main model right Right. And, and if you really boil it down to what it is, you could, when you think about that database layer, it, it doesn't really matter how you do it, right? Like you could mix all these technologies. You could, you could put entity framework in there. You could have a, a version of, of Hibernate running in there as well. You could also have Dapper in there. Like it doesn't really matter because ultimately if you're, if you're implementing this database gateway that sits on top of it, it doesn't care about what you do, right? Like if you wanted to get some object one way, but another object a different way, it doesn't matter. As long as whatever comes out of that thing adheres to that contract, hey man, do what you want, right? Yep, so, and like Hibernate will generate the SQL for you. Um, so we'll like link to SQL, things like that. Dapper is not, but either way, whether you're handcrafting that SQL or if you're having something generated for it, either way, you're going to want a separate layer there. And that means that you're going to want an outer layer too that kind of defines that interface. And, and that's what the other areas of your application will deal with. And it'll be this, this data layer behind it. And, and the interesting thing for me is a lot of times, like th this is the one part of this book that is kind of frustrating is they're very light on examples in terms of like, what's, what does the code look like? 
like they draw tons of pictures and they put, you know, dashed lines around things and all that. But if, if you're going to look at this in terms of like a, a .NET project in, in C Sharp, right? Like I totally can see you have the, the database layer, let's call it, as a project, right? It is something that can be compiled into an assembly. That is your project. The interfaces for this thing could totally be a separate project, right? Like you could literally have a database gateway project that would compile into its own assembly and it would just be a list of interfaces and abstract classes or whatever else, right? And then the use cases could be a totally separate project, right? It might even be multiple projects that all, but the key is, is the use cases are going to reference that database gateway project. And then the database layer itself is also going to reference that database uh, gateway project so that they can all implement and then cross those boundaries, right? So I think that was, that literally was the one thing that was kind of frustrating about this book is I really would have loved to have seen some more examples of not just, not just simple code, but Hey, how does, how does your actual project component breakdown look inside a solution or inside, you know, IntelliJ or, or visual studio or something like that, you know, but well, I know um, like layers can be kind of unpopular with programmers, right? Because they, they think about redundancy. They think about, I have to make this change over here and I've got to go plumb this thing all the way down to the database. I had a column, I had a column the database. I do it in the gateway. Now I'm in my use case, but uh, you know, the, I'm kind of on two of two minds. Like one hand, it's like, it's just typing, like get over it. On the other hand, like, you know, it's redundancy. It's a place for mistakes, more code, you know, more mistakes. Um, but on third hand, like, I kind of wonder too, like if you're just like, adding something in three, four or five layers, like paste, 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 paste. Like are you, does that mean that you've plumbed that use case to that database? You know, like what's the reason that you're having to do this plumbing? I, I don't know if that's the problem there, if that's indicative, but it's something to think about. Well, we talk about that in a little while too. So All right. um, yeah, that, that one's, that one's kind of interesting. So I'm looking at these, uh, these excellent charts that uh, outlaw pasted in the, uh, in the show notes last episode, it was episode 75. I'm looking at the cone of shame here. Oh, right. Yeah, that, that was, uh, I had fun trying to draw that just to make it look, match what was the previous, previously drawn there. It did a great job of it. Yeah, I loved it. So, uh, what we got up next? So, data mappers. Yeah. Who, who wants to kick this one off? Well, he says there's n- no such things as ORMs. I love this. I, I, I absolutely love this. Did you read this part, Joe? No. <laughs> Man, technical okay. difficulties. Sorry, guys. You meet some people that are going to take offense to that statement, though. Man, it, but he, does he make a good case? I mean, I guess they're all a good case because this whole thing, this whole book makes me feel dumb because I'm like, no, that's wrong. Wait, no, <laughs> no, you can totally have conditionals in your view. What are you talking about? Uh, oh, I shouldn't do that. And then you tell me all the reasons. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man, like, what he says and what he states here is, I mean, okay, let's, let's first off say he's splitting hairs, right? But whatever. Objects are not data structures from the user's point of view. That's okay. All right. What does that even mean? The users can only see the exposed behavior. So if you're a developer, you're the user of that object. You only get to see, if you're doing it properly, whatever was exposed in the interface, which is typically behavior. It's not mm-hmm. data properties, right? It's not, it's not all the properties on an object. So then what he says is a data structure has no implied behavior, which is what an ORM creates is a data structure because you do have access to the properties on it, right? It's typically nothing more than a DTO. You have an object with a ton of properties and you can read them, you can set them, you can do whatever you want. Is so, that true though? Cause like, I mean, let's pick on our boy here in any framework. I mean, there's definitely tons of behavior outside of crud. Not really. So, no. Te- te- well, okay, fine. Outside of what define outside of crud. Cause like if you could do reads of like, Hey, give me all of the associated objects to this one. That's just right? a relationship. Like, that's a data yeah, structure a, still though. It is. But that's not a behavior because remember, behavior is acting on the data somehow. So, you know. So, we're saying behavior in this in this case is defined as business logic. Yeah, yeah. That's not as right. in 
read logic. Right. Or, not, not read. This is literally, and that's kind of what he's saying here is what you get out of an ORM is a data structure. It's literally the, the, the record from a database or the record from some sort of storage thing just basically shoved into an object, right? So it's a bag of properties, essentially. Okay. It has no behavior. But does, that doesn't mean it's not an object. That's where I kind of, the distinction I had a hard time with, it's like, what do you mean it's not an object? Like in Java, the, the number 13 is an object. So it's just a matter of <laughs> how we're kind of defining things here. Yeah, I, mean, I, I get what he's saying though. Yeah, he's splitting hairs, right? Like I said, it's, when you, when you boil it down to it, he's basically throughout the book and even in other books, an object has behavior. In, in domain-driven design, when we talked about things, you know, things that you interact with have behavior. You shouldn't be thinking about them as, you know, the various different states that you're doing. That's, that's the job of something else. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the same, it reminds me of the same splitting hairs conversations that we've had before about like, you know, a DTO versus a POCO or a POJO, right? right? You know, like a DTO just has the data. There's no kind of functionality on it at all. Whereas a, a plain old class might have some methods on it that are simple, right? But it's it's more than just the data. You can you you're not just representing it as like a simple struct of data, right? Right. And and that's kind of what this sounds like. So I mean, it you know, really honestly, it's not all that relevant. Like, who cares what the ORM's called? But I thought it was a fun little section, right? To yeah. Just get people's ire up, I guess. A little um, clickbait sentence. Yeah, it really was. Um, <laughs> so yeah, whatever. Well, he does say that going back to our humble object, though, that, that these are a type of boundary between the gateway interface and the database, right? So, you know, going back, I guess that's how I, I kind of picked, you know, um, stated it, you know, a few minutes ago back then. I said, you, you know, you might have SQL Server and, and or uh, Oracle, and then on top of that, you would have Entity Framework or in Hibernate. And then on top of that, you'd have your interfaces. So, yeah, it's the boundary. The, the humble boundary. Yes. All right. So the next one that we have up are service listeners. And they also can implement the humble object pattern. And the, the way that I, that I interpreted this and wrote it down to sort of, I guess, simplify it in my mind was, you basically have this data transformation that proc to proxy classes a set to take data from the application, format it, and pass it over to the external service. So, so that's that's basically what they're talking about, right? Like just another layer that takes data, massages massages it, and then throws it across the way. So, word serverless. It's the future. <laughs> So I guess it might be in like common <clears throat> web apps today, then you would definitely, you could definitely say that that service listener would be like your, um, your C sharp or Java layer that, you know, you have your JavaScript on the client side, you have something running on the server side, then you have some kind of storage on the back end at a minimum. Right. Mm -hmm. And the service listener would be at, would be in that middle tier. I, in a middle middle tier, I would think, right? So, so if you think of like C sharp or or Node.js or anything, right, that's going to take a request from your client, right? right? That's the that's the service from your as far as your JavaScript part is concerned, right? It's that's, calling that other service, which is you know Node, as you get pointed out, or C sharp or Java. But then, but then the Perfect. whole humble thing though was once that hits that service, it's going to take that data and transform it in a way and send it to whatever the next tier is, right? And, and that's kind of what Right, they, it might take that request. So give me all the fi financial transactions for Alan. Mm -hmm. So, I might, so my, my, my client side might pass in, you know, the ID that I'm looking you know, to get the data for, mm -hmm. which would be Alan's ID. And then that call is eventually going to work its way back to some kind of database query proxied somehow right. and so massaged it got, it got transformed through. through many different layers before <laughs> yeah. it got to that database and then that data is then going to get massaged back out again yep as it comes filters its way back up through yes. it so yes yeah all right well 
So I guess then uh, at each one of these boundaries, we're likely to find a humble object. That's what it sounds like, or that's what it should be, right? This is what it sounds like. And then... Yeah, he says that the use of this pattern at, at these boundaries will increase your testability. Yeah, we can test everything up to that humble, humble object. So have them at the edge, the, the crust of your planet. I like that, the crust. The crust of your application. That's good. We, we're going to make our own. We like to eat here. So we're going to have a pie now, right? The, who wants the onion architecture? We have the pie. That's right. Oh, oh man. All right. So the, the next piece that we're going to talk about is partial boundaries. And this is where things start to make a little bit more sense in terms of, you know, how am I going to write my application without generating five gazillion lines of code, right? So the first thing he points out is full-blown boundary architecture is expensive. It makes sense. Like, I mean, how many inputs and outputs and, and, and all that garbage do you have to write for every single layer that they've talked about so far? I mean, What's a boundary, though? I forget. <laughs> Come on, man. Are you serious? Well, I know. I mean, just for our listeners, right? People who okay. read, <laughs> read the book in a couple of weeks, you know? Like, what's an example of a simple boundary for, for them? Oh, man. So <laughs> let's rewind then. And like your input, right? You, you have something that takes inputs and then it needs to output them. Your boundaries are how it's going to communicate those things, right? Like, so translating those inputs into something that the next class up, the dependencies as they go up, every layer, you're going to have these things that translate it. Because we said we're, you're not going to have an object down here is an input and it's going to pass up through five layers because as soon as you do that, if that object definition ever changes, you've got to change all five layers of classes. Bless Mm -hmm. you. So, so at each one of those layers, you're going to have these boundaries so that you have clean ways to pass data to and from. So it isolates them from change. Okay. So what's a partial boundary then? So, okay. If we, if we talked about this as like there was three tiers, like in that example that I just gave, right? Like if you only, and he even made fun of like the three tier thing, not being an architecture, right? All right. But if you said, okay, fine, there's a, there's a database, there's a web server, and then there's a, a front end client, let's call it. Um, and we talked about, you know, that you might have interfaces in between each of those in e- either of those levels, Right. If I recall right, we, we said that there'd be like, there was going to be six. I felt like it was what, what was the number, right? Because you were going to have two at each one. Am I thinking of that right? Well, no. You'd um, have at least one boundary in between each, right? So you'd right, have so there'd five be a boundary, total layers. There'd be a boundary between the client and the server mm-hmm. and a boundary between the server and the database. Mm-hmm. And so at each one of those boundaries, you would have um, an interface for each of those, but then an implementation of it on either side. Right. Right. So that's, you know, two interfaces, but four implementations. It, not necessarily going to be implementations on either side. There'd be one side to implement, but then the other side has to know how to go use that implementation. So it's going to usually be some sort of inversion of control, but, but yes. Well, let's say, no, no, no. Let's say that there was though, cause this is where I was getting, this is where in my mind, how I was visualizing the partial that was that like, you know, your, your client side has its own implementation of the interface so that it's not bound to the server side's implementation, but they're both using maybe the same interface. Okay. Right. If you're going full implementation, right. But the partial would be like, Hey, we're going to have the one interface with one implementation. So that they could be shared. Well, they do multiple ways of this, but the interesting thing is instead well, I guess of that wouldn't work. What I was saying instead of having this, so what they called it in this was reciprocating. Um, so so let's back up real quick on this. So when you have the full blown, and they have they have what they call their polymorphic interfaces both ways, which means that whatever's on the left side and the right side both have to implement this thing that's in the middle, right? Or or they they have to reference this thing in the middle. One's going to fulfill that contract. The other one's going to get the fulfillment from that contract, but they both adhere to that particular contract, right? And so that's really expensive because you're talking about your, your client side has to program to use this interface and this other side has to program to use the interface. And then you have all these inputs and outputs 
So your request and response objects that are going to be, you know, coming in and out of both sides of these things. So it's a lot of code and it's a lot to maintain. So you also have your dependency management on both sides of these things. So rather than do that, what they talked about with the partial boundary, and this was kind of interesting, is instead of having this, this middle tier that is all your interfaces and everything in here to just bundle it with whatever the component is, right? So bundle your interface with um, maybe your database tier. And then, and then that way when you go call it, if everybody's diligent about it, they use that interface and they, they use their dependency um, injection to fulfill whatever's going to do that interface. The problem that you run into is, and they showed it in one of the pictures and I don't remember what page it was on, but you have this interface and if everybody's just good about it and they're a good Samaritan, they're going to use that interface to get to whatever right. the object is, right? The problem is though, is you could easily, if you're just somebody go that's trying it. to get it done, you can just go right by it and you can go straight to the concrete implementation, right? So another way to say this then is if it was a full-blown, if you had full-blown boundaries, then everything would be deployed independent of the other. Correct. And so so one, one thing can't talk to another because it's not, come, it's not together. It's, it's not, not there. It's not, yeah. But to skip that and go with the partial boundary, then you let the... Um, uh, what was the thing that he called it? Not the dependency rule. The um, dang it, or maybe it was the dependency rule about about how you lose your code. Because that's kind of what you were saying, right? About the flow of your dependencies. Um, if you use the dependency rule principle, then um, you could deploy it all in one jar file or DLL or executable, or whatever. But um, you're you're you are relying on everyone to be um, consistent about their usage of it and diligent, right. And diligent about their usage of it. Right. And so, you know, it's kind of like the onus is on the developer that, you know, you're trusting that they won't uh, break that because since they would have direct access to the object and instead of, instead of, for example, instead of going through a factory to get the object, which would return back an implementation of an interface. Instead, they're like, you know what, I'm just going to go and create this. I'm going to new up this object myself right? Yep. That would be an example of how you could break that, right? Yep. You can totally bypass the interface. And the, the reason this partial boundary came up is because the first thing you led with is it's expensive, right? Because there's a ton of code to make all this happen. But you think about the code, but then this bundling into one thing, like you just said, one DLL or one jar file. This is huge because when you can do that, what does that buy you? you have a simpler build pipeline. You don't have version numbering to track to make sure that these components are interoperable now because you bundled those interfaces and those inputs and output classes with that particular component. So you know it's going to work with it. You don't have to worry about that. And consistent with a lot of what this book has been about, you're deferring the decision of whether or not and when you should break that thing out into its own thing. Right. And like, what does that even look like? Yep. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it feels like definitely partial boundary is your starting point. Yeah, and that's for a really lot the of the key. For a lot of the cases. All right, Joe, what you doing over there? Well, it's just it's easy to cheat the boundary, right? And so it's easy for things to get dirty and then it gets hard to split them up later. So I, I know in prior chapters, they kind of talked about like kind of treating things that are even in the same component as separate. So I think you can still maintain good discipline, especially if you're, if you're doing like a test first approach where you have to maintain that discipline. And I think that that really helps you kind of maintain partial boundaries and kind of get around some of those downsides. I just think it's dangerous. Like I know for me, like anytime, like I, I kind of try to cheat something like that. Like I end up slipping dependencies and get my arrows going all in the wrong directions. Well, yeah. And, and that's exactly what they said. Right. So there were a couple of ways that they did it. So they had it with the, did I, where did I put this? Well, oh, okay. The, the implementations are down a little bit further. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, he even mentioned in fitness, which he's used throughout this book in terms of, you know, the application that, that he wrote that he used a lot of these principles for is when they initially created that thing, they wanted to make sure that they only had to deploy one thing, right? One component, one jar. But when they talked about this, he said, you know, 
we, we wanted to keep the web mm. server separate from the actual code. And he said, and so we tried to do that, but we wanted it to be bundled all together. And he said, the problem is over time, they found out, okay, well, we don't really need the, a different web server to be pluggable. And so then what happened is exactly what we were talking about before, the dependencies started getting more tightly coupled to it. And, and so that whole decoupling became weaker. Right. And that's what happens. That's naturally what you're going to see if you, if you do these and you cheat these things. Well, but, another way to phrase that is we started leveraging the power of the web server or whatever in, in higher layers and it allowed us to get things done quicker. That's exactly what happens, right? And so you, you trade it off your decoupling for efficiency in creating it initially, right? It's a trade-off. Yep. Like none of this stuff is black and white, right? Like you're, you're not going to go write software and be like, it's going to be absolutely perfect because yeah. if you do that, you're never going to write any software. Yeah. We wouldn't have spent like tons of hours reading and talking about this book if it was just black and white and they could just go Google the answers. Right. Exactly. That, that's a great point. Um, so we said that the, the full on implementation requires two way reciprocation. That's all good. So this is where they got into where they had the picture with the little dotted line and it's the strategy pattern, which we've talked about before, which is selecting the algorithm you want to use at runtime. And this is all good, but you can bypass it. Right. You know, uh, weekly dev tips just did their uh, weekly episode on the strategy pattern. Oh, nice. It's, it's actually up next to my podcast, uh, uh, whatever it's called Podcatcher. Very cool. Yeah, so he mentions that another alternative to the strategy pattern here to solve this would be to use the facade pattern, right? Where this, the facade calls the necessary services when you make that, uh, that request, right? But there were a couple downsides of this. It, well, I guess similarly, you always have that possibility if you could go around it. Um, but uh, you're also dependent on it you know, if any one of those implementation, those facade implementations change, then everything is going to have to be recompiled as a result. But I feel like that was still true even with the strategy pattern. No, it doesn't have because to be. Because this is all still in one component. No, no, it doesn't have to be because, well, I mean, I guess if it was all in one component. Yeah, because this is all partial. Well, I think the, the difference was is if you do the strategy pattern, you could literally like hot load an assembly type thing to do it, right? The, the thing was because they were bundling the interface in with the other one. I think that's how they could do it. But with the facade pattern, you actually have a transient dependency all the way from the client to whatever it's using because it's just, it's straight up, it's hooked in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I just misunderstood then because I was thinking that like, a lot of what we were talking about here in this partial boundary section was should be bundled. You know, you were you were bundling things as a as a way to as a lazy way of doing it, but because you were trying to get around having to like version these things and manage that and separate them. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it could just be combining chapters too. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy enough to do. Uh, so then there's layers and boundaries. Yeah, this, this chapter was a lot more code focused, right? Uh, if I remember right, or maybe it was the next one. No, well, I mean, I don't know about code focused, but definitely a use one. case and example because he goes through, uh, you know, talking about the game Hunt the Wumpus as the use of it and how, you know, it starts out simple where maybe you want to have your game rules, um, you know, collected together in, in one uh, you know, circle, and then you know another layer might be the the languages that you want to support, right? And then it gets a little bit more complicated because it's like, well, okay, you're going to need another layer that's going to be how you're going to persist the results of the game, uh, or the, you know, the current health. step, right? <laughs> yeah, and and then and then it just starts building on there because then it's like, okay. You know, like you you mentioned player health. Uh, there's the mapping data, and then it's like, oh, what about multiplayer? So then you need network layers. Um, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, 
we don't want to dive too deep into this particular one because it was a lot of diagrams, right? Like this one was a ton of diagrams, drawing lines, all that kind of stuff, showing you how you could break these things out. But the key, the key takeaway on this one was the architectural boundaries are all over the place, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it started out super simple, but as you started expanding it, like it, th they were everywhere. Um, yeah. And, and that these boundaries are expensive to implement. But if you ignore them, they're very expensive to add after the fact. Even if he makes the case, even if you do have a good set of use cases, of test cases around these, um, these boundaries, they're still, it's still hard to go back in and break that apart. And you know the, the crazy part about when they say when they're ignored I think that's if you just completely aren't using any kind of thoughts when you're doing your components, right? Like you could put in the partial boundaries and you might've set yourself up so that it wouldn't be so bad. But if you literally are just coding it and you're not thinking about some of these, these decisions as you go. Yeah. Coming back and trying to plug those things in later mm -hmm. could be a real yeah, really tough. Yeah. So here's the thing. You're trying to be a good architect. What, what are you to do in this situation? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> guess wisely but i do think that uh you know like we talked about earlier like if you can get the test going i think that's a good way of kind of reinforcing the right behaviors and if you do decide to refactor later down the line i think that test cut kind of help you give you that confidence that you need to do that refactoring and so uh they don't mention it in the book but just based on what i'm hearing kind of um reading here in the background i think that testing seems like a pretty good strategy for at least uh kind of keeping those options open i mean ultimately you know it's just comes down to kind of guessing or trying to, to make your, your um, best guesstimate. It's funny though. You say the testing's a good way. We'll find out in a little while. There's some pitfalls to that too. Yeah. yeah well, I mean like let, let's explore that for a moment though, because I mean, conventional kind of, you know, wisdom and conversations kind of follow along with what Joe said mm -hmm. and what, and what uncle Bob says here in this, in this part of the book is going against that because he's saying that like, Hey, even if you do have the unit test, the, it's still going to be very expensive. So, you know, an example might be like if you have some object that you're using and everywhere you're, you're just directly mewing it up everywhere. You're not, you don't have an interface for it. You're passing it around. You're, um, you know, at, by the class name, you're directly mewing it up. So there's no layer of like a factory pattern in between or anything like that. Builder pattern or nothing. Um, you know, then, uh, you know, when it does come time to you decide like, oh, I now want, you know, something else that's very similar to this thing, but kind of different. So maybe I want to have both of these things implemented in an interface. Now you got to go by after the fact and change the first one to now implement that interface that also meets whatever desire you have for the second version of that thing too. And you got to go back and change all the use cases, all the other places, all the touch points where that first one was being used to pass in the interface, all the places where it was being newed up by, you know, um, just, you know, newing it up directly, you know, you're going to want to go back and change all that and then refactor, you know, the test cases appropriately. That's a lot of, you know, that's, that's an expensive and risky change to go back after the fact, which is kind of his point here. Yep. Yeah. So generally you just don't do it and you code additively and you keep adding to the pile, right? Yeah, that's what we're trying to avoid. It, right. that, that is what you're trying to avoid, but that's why he said, you know, what, what does an architect do? You said it, you guess. But the other thing too is you do, you try to at least be intelligent about what you're doing and you constantly iterate on it. You, right. It's not a one and done thing, right? It's not, hey, we built it this way, it's done. It's if, okay, as yeah. it evolves. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're first going to try to figure out where these boundaries are in the beginning. You're going to decide, okay, which, which of these boundaries can I ignore? Which of them do I need to partially implement, fully implement? And then you're going to keep doing that. Like you said, this is a rinse and repeat. This is not a one-time decision. You're going, to, you're going to keep looking for the friction where these, uh, and then you know, where these boundaries don't exist and then reevaluate, right? And your goal here is to implement these boundaries that you know, once the cost to implement them is less than the cost to ignore, then that's when you're going you're gonna to implement it. And you're going to keep doing that throughout the life cycle of the system. Yep.
And don't fire your arrows until you smell the wumpus. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that, but I somehow survived. Uh, yeah. Words of wisdom yes. from Joe Zach. <laughs> Deep thoughts by Joe Zach. <laughs> you must smell the wumpus first. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should Google Hunt the Wumpus and like play it in your browser. Or you should code implementation uh, for fun. There you go. There you go. So this next chapter for me, honestly, is kind of what was the glue for the entire book. Like, it, it was very code heavy in trying to describe where some of the things happen. So th- it's called the main component. And it's basically the entry point of your application. It's the overseer of everything. And he even dubs it the ultimate detail. I like that name for it. He says that this is the lowest level policy. And this is where all comes together, right? Yeah, it is. And there's only one thing that depends on it. The OS, whatever's running it is the only thing that cares about it. And this is the reason why I like this one so much is we've talked about dependency inversion. We've talked about dependency injection. We've talked about DI frameworks. We've talked about IOC containers and all this kind of stuff. And none of it's really kind of come together anywhere yet, right? This is where the rubber met the road. If you want to know where dependency injection and inversion and all that stuff happens, the way that it was shown and described in this chapter was, is basically all in this main, this main class and this main method where they basically put all the crap Mm -hmm. from the entire thing there. So all your string constants, all the um, newing up of the game board for the uh, Hunt the Wumpus, and like literally everything was created in this main thing and then supposed to be passed along. Yeah, Yeah, Would you say it's the humblest of objects? Yeah, the dirtiest, the, absolutely. The thing that you would not test because you couldn't. There's, there's mm-hmm. too many implementation details here that are all kind of decided. It says, this is where you should create all the factories, the strategies, the global facilities, all that. That's yeah, why they actually mentioned that you might want to have another kind of version of this main and use that as a test, like a big integration test or something. Or, uh, you know, you could uh, kind of develop little slices. I think about Unity, like you can create different scenes so like one thing I might do is like just create a new blank scene, throw my character in there while I'm working on something, you know, kind of mess around, make sure it's working and then kind of take it back to my scene and actually work in it where you might have to get to a tricky area or something or navigate through the game to actually see it in action. It's just easier to kind of new up a, like a kind of a, a quick test environment to, to work on. Yeah. So this is your outermost circle. It does all of it. It says it does all the dirty work. I didn't um, see any, talking about any. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're good. Go ahead. I oh, see. I didn't see anything about dependency injection here. And like that's one thing I kind of thought about. Like when I set up like a bindings file or something, if I'm messing with the dependency injection framework, that's somewhere where I'll usually say like, "Hey, this interface gets you this concrete thing." And, and sometimes it's an XML, sometimes it's in class. But that, I think of that a lot of times as being like this kind of central point that touches everything dirty and that's outside the main. Um, but it's still, still pretty dang dirty. Well, well, I guess it's going to depend on your dependency injection framework too though. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, like I'm thinking structure map as an example. I haven't actually used that one. I mean, Joe and I were talking about this like, probably a few weeks back. Like I was getting really frustrated because I wanted to do some DI in a library and it just, it, it doesn't work very well because there's not a a given entry point, right? With main, it is your entry point. So if you're trying to do dependency injection, you know what you need to set up there. So your IOC container, if you're going to do it, it would be in that main. Even even if you're calling off to something to do it for you, but the the goal is is that main is going to be what sets that stuff up. Um, they didn't show a DI framework, but they did show dependency injection in this because I, I think they had factories that newed up like the, uh, uh, I want to say it was like even the map, right, in, in this main method. So they, they do dependency injection, but they weren't using a DI framework for this kind of thing. I think uh, a lot of those, are, like at least my experiments with the DI frameworks and like Unity and stuff, like once I start getting the injection train really rolling, I end up with, less and less arguments past the methods because those things are now specified at the class level. And then now the class is, um, is, you know, kind of 
modeled more around behavior rather than data, which is how I tend to typically program just because of years of, of uh, questionable habits. But uh, I do think that when I kind of start with DI or when I go back and kind of add it, I keep feeling like the code that I'm writing is closer and closer to what the code I'm reading about is supposed to look like. So real quick on this one, only because I was looking at like one of the things that they showed is in one of their factories, they didn't, the factory, it, it wasn't your standard call the factory and it returns you an object. They passed the name of the class to the factory. Mm. And what that does is what we've talked about before, like how you loosely couple things that's literally going to load up a Java class that may not have been there, right? Like it, it, the dependency might not have even been in that particular jar. It's injected whenever you build or compile or whatever, um, when you bring all the stuff together. And if you wanted to do something like that in .NET, .NET there's actually a load assembly um, that you can call that will do something similar to that. So when we talk about decoupling these things, it can literally be hey, this class isn't something that you actually have available right now. You're going to tell it what you want it to load up, and it's going to go try and find that assembly somewhere and use it, right? Yeah. He referred to main as saying it was basically a plugin that you could have multiple versions of this thing. You might have a version for development. You might have a version for production. Maybe you have a test version. But that... Feels so I get, the, I get the plugin statement i'm okay i'm on board with that part because you know if you think about like okay well you're just plugging in all the dependencies and everything but i don't like the idea of saying to have multiple versions of it i don't want to continue that that thought i don't want to like i don't want to i don't want to encourage anyone to do that it goes against our 12 factor app right like having multiple entry points having having different versions of the app like the you know the the dev version should be on parity with the prod version, right? So the I mean that oh. that was like one of the tenets of the twelve factor app. So I, I kind of didn't like that part of it though. Yeah, you get something working in tests and you don't realize that there's something because it kind of implies that you're only working on tests and you're not messing with the right production. Yeah, that's something I'd yeah. rather rather see kind so, of. Configured. I'm okay with calling it a plugin since like, you know, you are pl kind of quote plugging in all the dependencies. Right. Right. But I don't want to encourage people to have different versions of this thing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, my dev version works great. Nobody's ever heard that before. Right. Like it works right. on my machine. <laughs> yeah. That, that's what I don't like. <laughs> well, I was kind of thinking like, um, you know, PowerShell's got that, that what if convention. So if you pass like dash, what if it'll tell you like what will change and it's mm -hmm. supposed to be a safe way. Or like in Linux, it would be dash dash dry run. Yeah, um, I think so. yes. I don't. I don't know. I've never seen that in Linux, but in, in Bash. I well, I mean, yeah. There's. It's in like I know a lot of Git commands that have that, but I'm trying to think of some cool. other uh, Bash commands that would have that, or you know, just shell commands that would have that. Oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, but but yeah, the idea is, um, you know, I could potentially have. Uh, I almost treat it like a kind of a state machine or something. Where it's like, hey, if you're doing the what if, rather than me having a bunch of like kind of inner functions that each take the like, you know, am I in what if mode, what if mode, what if mode, and doing that plumbing, I might have two different kind of uh, higher level points that sort of act like a main here. So I might have like the what if main and the regular main and both of them all use the same parts just arranged slightly differently. Or I could just, you know, pass the what if flag to any relevant inner functions. So yeah, yeah, I guess I, now I've I kind of talked myself out of it because it's kind of weird to have this like, well, here's the main that you call and it's going to decide to call one of these other mains. It's like, well, at that point, I've, now we're talking three mains and uh, yeah. I just kind that, of view the, right. that, that what if would be before the transaction, like you're either going to commit it and do the action or you're not, right? Well, if, like if you're doing like a file level stuff or something, that would be not necessarily be a transaction that you can apply. Well, the transaction might be like a rename or a delete. Yeah. Right. But there's All like, right. there's no own new at like the operating system level or at least not one I want to rely on. Hmm. I don't know. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that said, uh, if you haven't left us a review already, we would greatly appreciate it if you would. Oh you man. Had, 
You what? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I'm tired, guys. I'm tired. I had a brilliant idea the other day. Okay. And it, it deals with reviews. Oh, okay. I was thinking like we really appreciate the reviews so much. Uh, and it means a lot to us. And we really appreciate uh, everyone who does it, everyone who's ever done it. And so I thought, like, wouldn't it be cool if we sent stickers to everyone who writes a review? And, uh, well, you know, the problem is that anyone historically, like the 500 people or whatever, uh, have who've written them before. Like, well, what about that? Like, well, I thought, you know, hey, if you screen cap link or just, you know, write us and tell us you sent a review, I, I would be happy to send you stickers. Now, unfortunately, I didn't talk about this with you guys ahead of time. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a little awkward now to say like, hey, perhaps we should volunteer to send a crap ton of stickers uh, out to people for free. But I don't know. What do you guys think? I'm fine with it. All right. I'll do the mailing. I, I vote nay. Just because I feel like <laughs> someone had to. Like on air. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm all for it. All yeah. right. So let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, if, you, if you write a review or if you've ever written a review and you send us uh, an email about it or let us know about it, then uh, and an address. I will send you out stickers for free, international too, because <laughs> what the heck? It's late. I don't care. Yeah, that's what we do. We give here. So yes, the the point of all that is we really do appreciate it, and you know. Yeah, I don't. I don't care. We could have. We could literally have a billion reviews. As soon as we get that next new review, it's like the first one all over. It again. really is, man. It, it, it really, we really do appreciate it. Uh, it really does put a smile on our face. It means a lot to us, and um, you know, we we really do appreciate that you take the time out of your day uh, to write that. So you can head to www.codingblocks.net/review, where you can find uh, some little shortcut links there for you to some of the platforms. Uh, or maybe you know of one that we missed and you want to leave your review there, by all means, please do. And hey, by the way, let us know where you left some of those reviews, you know, yep. uh, in case if we need to modify our list, right? Um, so with that, let's head into my favorite portion of the show. Survey says, and with that, Last episode, in the spirit of Valentine's Day, we asked, have you ever made a mixed tape? And your choices were, does a playlist count? Oh, it, it doesn't? Uh, then no, I haven't. Or, man, I got my technique down and everything. I know exactly when to play Bon Jovi's five words. Yes, I have. All right, so uh, Alan, let's go you first. Which one do you think is the popular vote with a percentage? Man, I, I'm going to be I'm going to be hopeful here that we have we have some just awesome people. And I'm going to go, man. I got my technique down and everything. All right, I know right. exactly when that we're going to go with 65 percent 65 i like that i dig the optimism i like that all right joe well i'm checking online right now to see if you can uh <laughs> yes you can there is a company out there <laughs> that will create a mixtape <laughs> yeah no will create a mixtape oh no wait no you know what it looks like a tape but it's actually a usb drive okay so that doesn't count all That's right so name. i'm gonna say uh oh. heck no what? And I'm going to say, uh, play this count. I'm going to say, uh, 62%. Man, 62%. Uh, and, uh, for, like, not everybody is Rome, Romeo, like ourselves, you know, 62%. No, they haven't made a mixtape, uh, because playlists don't count. And 65%, yes, yes. they've made a playlist. Well, so, we're both wrong. <laughs> By the Price is Right rules, you're both wrong on the percentage. I, I'll tell you that. You're both like very optimistic, uh, which is, you know, that's awesome. Congrats for you. <laughs> but uh, Joe won the popular. Oh, man, come on. Since a playlist doesn't count, then no mixtape. I have a new mission in life. I'm going to get you people like, you got you to gotta be suave or... 
you know no nowadays it's probably like here's my spotify playlist go go listen to this here's my itunes playlist yeah i guess sitting around listening for the radio song to come on for four hours doesn't really exist <laughs> no man that that's those days are long gone that was you got to take time for romance that's just- you, I'm next. Not anymore. Now with now with these subscription services you got now, man, you got access to all the music ever made. <laughs> Joe, you got to take time. <laughs> no, I, I I pay for Spotify, so I don't have to romance things. <laughs> you know, sometimes I put like little references in here, and I'm not sure if like I wonder sometimes if people get my sense of humor or anything, or if like it even if you even get it. You know, did did anyone happen to catch the like like consider? Let me just tell you, there are multiple Easter eggs and some of the things that I throw out there in like the show notes or the conversation or whatnot. Well, who's so, Ben Javi? Did did <laughs> Ben Javi? <laughs> yeah, that was one. Uh, no, but like d- d- any reference to like the man, I got my technique down and everything. That sounds familiar. Like Friday or so. I, I no, no, no guess, Joe. I'm terrible with references to anything. I was when I wrote that I was thinking of Samuel L. Jackson from Pulp Fiction. Oh man, I've never seen it. What? Yeah, I don't know why. Oh my god, Alan. Yeah, I don't know why. Jeez. <laughs> god, All right, we're gonna, we're gonna need to do a, a coding blocks blocks episode one of these days where we just I don't know maybe we take it offline where we kind of discuss. <laughs> Some of these Bring things. Alan up to speed on the <laughs> on the ways of the world. The world. Yeah, we're, we're gonna have to table this for now, but yeah, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna help you. We keep saying that we're gonna do like a yes, yes, no with him, and yeah. we we never have. But I'm always. It'll be, be hilarious. No. Though. It's not gonna be fun. Well, that's the point. That's the point. <laughs> it's supposed to start off. The whole point of a yes, yes, no is that like you're supposed to bring something to us. Like, what does woke mean? <laughs> what does it mean to be woke? And then you know we're gonna say okay, like you don't know, so you're a no. Joe knows, I know, so we're yeses, and then we got to explain it from there. Like, that's the whole point. But, but I feel like it'll always be me saying, what's this? Right. <laughs> no, yes, no, no, no. Exactly. Reply All has recently done some sports yes, yes, well, yes, no, no's. Ah, it, it's quite entertaining as well. I can win those. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> those, you would definitely win those. I, I would win those. <laughs> All right. So for this episode's survey, we ask, uh, and this was sent in to us by uh, Joe Recursion Joe. This was uh, themed off of one of his ideas that he had, which was, uh, hey, when you're not coding, be it for school or work, um, but you know whatever your quote professional uh, version of that would be, in your free time, do you eat, sleep, code, repeat? Coding is all that matters. Or do you got to be well-rounded? Get outside, ride a bike, climb a mountain, hike a trail. Or do you just sit back and watch Netflix, binge watch everything? Or if you're like Spoons, Rocket League. Or insert favorite video game title here. Yeah, and you know what? If we didn't list one of the options you like, you can always drop a comment and tell us what you do like to do, and uh, you might win a book out of it. Yep, codingblocks.net slash episode 76. And we're back. And we just happened to look at the clock and realize just how long we've gone. So we know that we told you that this is going to be our last episode on clean architecture. But uh, in order to um, make a better listening experience for you guys and get to bed at a manageable time, we're going to cut this one a little bit short and skip ahead to our resources. And we'll have a, a part two of this guy coming out pretty soon here. So thanks for sticking with us and uh, on to resources we like. Which will be simple. It'll be obviously clean architecture, which has been pretty much the resource we like for this entire series. Yeah. It's been what, like three months? <laughs> like it's 10 been, months. I don't want to quantify it at all. <laughs> but I do want to say um, we're, we're not uh, like, so we're capping our discussion on this book, uh, you know, after the the next episode, but there's actually a ton more to it. The appendix is really good. There's a lot of different sections on here that dive into more specific examples. There's more code in there, which is really nice. Uh, and in fact, there's a whole big section of the book called details that really kind of dives into those, some of those tough questions that we've kind of argued back and forth. So uh, definitely worth picking up. Highly recommend it. Love this book. The well, binding I, mean, is I don't really even bad. want to say that we might not come back to it though. We might 
Good. Want to come back to it? We just want to take a break. From yeah, it. we are. We are going to to kick back a little. So with that, is is my favorite part of the show. It's the tip of the week. So what you got, Joe? Yes. So Friday, like five o'clock last week, I was trying to figure out this weird bug that just started happening on something I hadn't even touched recently. Right. Uh, JavaScript error. It just wasn't working. I knew it worked a few days earlier. I'm looking at the stack trace. It's like a mile long. I'm trying to, to figure out what I did. Um, eventually I started looking at the file history, nothing, not seeing anything that, that should have mattered at all. I'm blaming the framework right now. I'm convinced like this is a bug. And at some point I didn't even realize I had done this because I know this is a terrible anti-pattern. I know like it's kind of a programmer cliche to do, but at some point, my bug hunt went from trying to figure out what was wrong and it changed into trying to prove that my framework was wrong (laughs) so that I could show somebody and be like, look, it doesn't make sense right here. And I was so desperate for this that I kind of lost sight of the actual um, bug. And anyway, by the time I figured out, I'd finally looked at through enough history and I looked at some files I didn't think mattered because everything was obviously correct because I had typed it all myself. It's from my files. Uh, it turned out that I'd reused a, a variable. So I had a variable above my JavaScript method and I had a closure, which took an argument in that was the same variable name. So in, in the closure, I was thinking I was referencing the outer item. I was actually referencing the inner and it just so happened the framework, I would have expected it to be the same value anyway. But in this case, it wasn't. It was slightly different. It was actually like a shallow copy that was just missing some stuff that I hadn't expected. I wouldn't have guessed based on looking at the error. Anyway, long story, still long. (laughs) Use tools. Uh, I had been griping about this in the JavaScript channel on the Slack. And uh, when I finally came back, you know, on Monday and said, okay, Friday night, Saturday, Monday, I figured it out. I'm an idiot. Here's what it was. Everyone's like, well, uh, you know, no doy. <laughs> WebStorm highlights that for you. And I was like, well, I, I've got time to open up a second IDE. I mean, come on. Like, what you got <laughs> Friday night? You got Saturday? You got Sunday or Monday morning <laughs> to look into this thing? I was like, well, that's a really good point. There's actually really good tools for this sort of thing. And so I don't know exactly what, at what point you should cut over to using more advanced tools. And obviously I uh, didn't get this one right, but I had that available to me. So I just want to kind of, it's a reminder out there. Like when you're bashing your head against the wall, trying to figure out what's wrong, sometimes it's good to kind of take a step back and think about different approaches. And so uh, WebStorm is an example here. I'm sure there are really great plugins for Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio that would have uh, helped me out here too. And so, you know, I could have spent five minutes downloading that and opening that and would have found the problem a lot quicker. So that's my tip. Don't, don't be like me. <laughs> yeah. You know, the funny part about that is like a, a month ago, I committed some code in to, you know, one of these JavaScript files that I know that Joe's heavily working in. Right. And, and I committed it locally, you know, I didn't push it up or anything, but I went ahead and just introduced this new variable name uh, in, in the outer in, uh, closure. And then, you know, Friday afternoon, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to drop this bug, right? Yep. So I went ahead and just pushed that in. But because I didn't rebase or anything, it was like way back in the history of the Git log so that he'd never find this thing, right? <laughs> yep. It was hilarious that all weekend he was like, I can't figure out why this is so good. You know what's funny there is um, the, the deal was I, I had this closure from the get-go and I was only using one variable. And it was something that passed from the, from the uh, framework, so I just had to find that one variable. And then at some point I realized, oh, you know what? I want to make use of the third variable that's passed to this closure. So I went in to the docs and said, okay, here's the three argument names that they've got. Copy to paste it into my argument list. And it just so happened that that second variable, the one I wasn't even using, the one I didn't care about at all, was the one that had overlapped because I had used kind of a generic term uh, in my data store. And that's what did it. And I didn't realize at the time because I was so focused on testing the one thing I was working on there. It was in the UI. You know, it wasn't something easy to catch. And it wasn't until much later that I realized that something really strange was happening. Man, that's not fun. Nope. All right. I could have been playing Into the Breach. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, I've got a couple of them for you. So the first one is just kind of like, like this, duh, why didn't I already think about this kind of moment that I had? But, um, you know, every one of us on this show, we, we've talked about the show notes um, that we put out there for each episode. And so if you haven't already checked it out, you're really doing yourself a disservice. So like for this episode, head to www.codingblocks.net slash episode 76, and you'll be able to find all of the show notes uh, as it relates to this episode, right? But then what I had ne- what never dawned on me is that um, part of the way we um, publish our episodes, those show notes are included with the episode. So you can literally follow along with what we're saying as you're listening to us saying it all in your podcast player, whatever app you're using, right? So you can see and click around and you know whatnot and follow along with what we're saying. And for some reason, that just never dawned on me before. I don't know why, but it finally did. And I was like, oh man, this should definitely be a tip of the week. So there's my, uh, why didn't I think of that sooner tip of the week. And then this other one that I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize you could do that. Was that um, in Visual Studio Code, um, I knew that you could like, you know, highlight something and do it F12 and go to the definition of it. What I didn't know is that you could control click that thing and go to the definition of it. Control click? Like, yes. Really? When you click the, when you press control, uh, it'll, if it's a fully named thing, you know, it'll underline it to let you know that it's clickable. And you're like, oh, wait, what does that do? And you click it and boom, there you are in the definition. So if you have like some kind of class name or something like that, um, and you, then you could, you could go to the definition of that, that class or maybe like in your um, object, you might have a dot property on it and you could go to the definition of that. So I'll include a, a link to Microsoft's documentation for it, but um, cause they talk about multiple ways to go to the definition, but control click has definitely become like my new favorite. Awesome. I love visual studio code. All right. So mine, I've got a few here again, cause it's always stream of consciousness and I can never really remember any of this stuff. And even if I mark it down, I somehow forget where they are. So, the first one is I sent a tweet out about that, this particular one earlier this week, and it's named arguments in C sharp. And it's been available since version four, uh, not of the, it, like the C sharp language version four. Right. And really all it is is this, if you've got a method that you're calling that has a super long parameter list, which we've talked about as sort of a code smell, but there are some times that you just can't get around it. It's kind of frustrating when you look at it, you see a string and you see true, true, false, you know, a number. And you're like, I have no idea what this is. And if you're not in an IDE, then it's really even more of a pain because now you can't even go look, right? Like if you're just browsing your code on Git or whatever, you don't even know. Well, you can do named arguments, which would literally put the name of the parameter colon and then whatever the value is. So if you are looking in something like, you know, your VSTS repo or GitHub or whatever, you can actually see there, oh, this is the name of the parameter and here's the argument value that goes along with it. So it's a really nice way of being able to see directly what you're passing to a method. So you know, that's, um, that's really great for optional arguments too. So if you've got like one argument that's required and say that, you know, you want to use the fifth one and everything between there isn't, you can just do first argument comma, then the name of the one you want to specify and then that one. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. You don't even have to put all five or six arguments in there. You just do the two that you want. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And this isn't just a, a C sharp thing. I mean, like plenty of other languages have the same feature. Right. 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 Yeah. I think uh, you see this in Python all the that's time. That's what I was going to say. One of the guys actually was like, oh man, I use this in Python all the time. I didn't know it was in C sharp because mm-hmm. he was doing Unity development. So does yeah. Java have it? I don't know if Java does or not. Um, I wonder if I can Google that Java named arguments. Let's see. I see a Google feud in our future, Joe. Get brace yourself. The best Java idiom I've seen for simulating keyword arguments and constructors is the builder pattern. So no, it does not look like they do. 
Yeah, I see how like Spring does it with annotations and some other things, but man. Oh, wait, that was asked a long time ago, though. Maybe there are. Anyways, yeah, let us know in the comments. You win a yeah. book. I have no idea. Um. Oh, no, they do know. It looks, nah, I don't know. Anyway, I take it back. All my rambling is gone. All right, so the next one I have is, okay, so if you think that long parameter lists are code smell, and we've mentioned that they are in the past, I've got a link here for refactoring.guru smells long parameter lists, and they have a few ways that you can get rid of it and the reasons why you might do it and the reasons why you might not. So that's just a, an external link for anybody that's interested. And then, because we've been talking about architecture, so my buddy Ryan showed me this today, and I found this by going to GitHub and looking at trending. So you can go to github.com slash trending, and if you're interested in a particular language, you can choose that language over on the right-hand side of the page, and it'll show you all the, the hot trending things on GitHub, right? So I went and looked for C Sharp, and there is one in here called eShop on Containers, that Microsoft has basically put together their entire list of best practices for doing like a microservices architecture in containers, in Azure, in what it, like, it's amazing. So if you ever want to see how to write a very complex distributed application that can scale, they've got like their best practice thing up here that all uses Docker. And it'll run on Windows. It'll run on Linux. Like you can, you can literally set this thing up and get it running. You can, you can clone the repo and do it all. But I highly recommend it. Mixed in here, they've got things such as the domain-driven design patterns on some of these things. They've got some nice little diagrams that even show you, you know, what they did in various different places. Their microservices, their MVC app, all that. So highly recommend this thing. It, it's cool to look at if you're trying to learn about, you know how you can set up these complicated and complex architectures. So I just went into the docs directory here just to see, you know, how nice that was. Uh, they've got whole eBooks in here in yeah. English and Spanish and Chinese. <laughs> what? Dude, this thing, they've even got, so check this out. They've even got at the bottom uh, orchestrators, Kubernetes and service fabric in Azure. Like seriously? Like, I mean, Look, you could literally go do this thing and learn how to <clears throat> set up and deploy a, a multifaceted application. <clears throat> like really, really cool stuff here. Yeah, even outside of Microsoft, this is just great general advice. Like I'm looking at an introduction to containers and Docker right now. It's in one of the eBooks in the docs. It's incredible. Yeah, man. It's all tailored. Like the, the books look like they're heavily tailored towards this kind of setup and stuff. So it looks like it'll save you some time just like read here and then go click, click, boom, and see what they're talking about. Yep. So I was curious about your named parameter list and the top answer on Stack Overflow as of February of 2017 is a no. On Java. Oh, for Java, yeah. And mm -hmm. there's a, actually a Wikipedia page for named parameter and it lists uh, all of the, well, it's a non-exhaustive list of languages, but Java is not, in that list. Interesting. And I also looked up, I was curious, I was like, does Java even have, or does it have uh, optional arguments? So I, I looked and it, <laughs> the answers are pretty funny. It's like, no, but here's how you can do it. You can define a variable called, you know, default argument one and just pass it right there. <laughs> you could do uh, create multiple methods that have different sets of arguments. Right. Like, man, mm -hmm. that's not, that's not the question. It's not the same. Right. I mean, I, I have been doing more Java development lately because yeah <laughs> so <laughs> i've there been, are probably great reasons for it. it it's been catching up a little bit though like they now have anonymous methods that are similar to light link type stuff right so yeah, there's there's definitely they're catching back up with c sharp i mean obviously they were kind of what man there's gonna be some java developers mad at you i know I, I, I mean, there's just so many nice syntactic sugar things in C Sharp that feel very verbose in Java, but it, it's it's definitely gotten better since I last messed with it heavily. You know, like I'll put it out there. Give me var, give me death. 
<laughs> uh, well, I was thinking though that there's a lot in the Java community there where they're way ahead. Though. Oh, definitely, definitely. If you go outside of Java and you do something like Groovy, even they're probably way further along than than what other languages are. So, I mean, you know, not picking on them, but it it does feel like for me who is used to C sharp that it's actually it's gotten friendlier. Yeah, I mean, so many concepts come out of the Java community. It's incredible. So I think um, Java the language. No, no, so you know, compared to C sharp, you know, whatever. But Java developers, top notch. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, a few octaves went up there, you. Yeah. That's yep. awesome. All right, so that's a that's a good lord, guys. All right, yeah. so yeah, <laughs> we did some talking about uh, humble object layers and boundaries, main components. Uh, database gateways. We remind you that there's no such thing as an ORM. Um, yeah, we're really sorry for cutting this one short, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We hate doing that. Yeah. So uh, we will continue this conversation one last time. But until then, uh, should you be listening to us because a friend happened to point you to the website or you're listening on their device and, uh, you know, or they just said, hey, they, they opened up your own device and said, hey, listen to this. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and more using your favorite podcast app so that you can subscribe to us and leave us a review if you haven't already by heading to www.codingblocks.net slash review. And while you're up there, check out our show notes, examples, discussions, and more. And we've got a, a fantastic Slack community. So if you've got feedback, questions, or rants, um, then you can take it there and talk to people that are much smarter than I am about it. And uh, make sure to follow us on Twitter at CodingBlocks or head over to CodingBlocks.net. And remember, comment on the blog post for a book or send us uh, you know, review and send us an email uh, with an address and uh, we'll hook you up with free stickers. It's hey, a limited time offer. You know, <laughs> in case it goes terribly. So uh, send, it, send it quick. Uh, and, and by the way, for the Slack thing, go to CodingBlocks.net slash Slack if you want to join. Yep, you can invite yourself. Yep. All right, guys, that's a wrap.